It is a lovely day. Power's back on. And what we've learned is that the power within is much greater than the power from without. Yes, electricity is an amazing thing. And we should always be able to tap into it and have it. But greater than electricity that powers our homes with electricity, with warmth, with light, is the power that we have to illuminate. We are the light. Yeah. That's what this holiday taught us here in Montreal with 1.3 million people without electricity. We didn't have electricity for 46 hours straight. And yet, we were illuminated. We were the light. Yeah. We are the light. <laughs> Welcome to Tanya Today. I'm Rabbi Ronnie Fine coming to you from Chabad Zurich and Kadeshim in Montreal, Canada. It's a privilege and a pleasure to share with you the Tanya. And we share it with TJ Terrence in Melbourne, Australia. Welcome. Brett is joining us in Pennsylvania. Boketov. Rachamim in Houston, Texas is with us. Amazing, we got some new people that are day in, day out. Beautiful. Brad Rachami, Rabab in Morocco, Shalom. We have, and I have a tough one pronouncing this, Jilmara Josepha. Ooh la la. Shavua Tov. You have to remind me where you're from. And uh, give me the phonetics on how I should uh, pronounce your name. I'm sorry if I don't do it right. A good morning to Eugenia in Calgary. Julia has joined us in an incredibly lovely spring day in Pennsylvania. Moshe Bokertov in California, I think it is. Unless you're back in Arizona. John in North Carolina, Shalom. Clem is in Brisbane, where it is very light. L- light, late, rather. Not light, dark. Rusty in Texas, good morning. Sandy's joined us in Michigan, welcome. David in Gold River, California. Jan is in Mexico, Boker Tov. Chava, Boulder, Colorado. Celeste, thank you for joining. Louise is in Sydney, Australia. Greetings from there, beautiful. Leah is in Florida with us. Uh, Marky is not certain, but thank you for joining. Liba and Davida in New York. Good morning. Cindy in Florida has joined us. Diane in Arizona. Gary in Pennsylvania. Daphne is having a marvelous Monday in South Carolina. Jane is in the Philippines. Good evening. Priscilla from Canada, a Canadian. Welcome. Stan, good afternoon to you in London, on in London, England, that is. <laughs> Louise, uh, Sydney, Australia. I think we mentioned. Yes. Southern Oregon is uh, Marky. Welcome. Jeff in Michigan is with us. We have Vilma, Eliana, Adam, Jay, uh, Clubhousers, Instagrammers. We got Rachel in South Carolina, Akoy in Lima, Peru. Alice is in Baltimore. Marilyn is in um, Delaware. Andrea Okotov from. Sarah, uh, formerly from Montreal, now in Paris. 
How are you? Who else is joining us from Israel? Natanya. Beautiful. And to Talabenta. How are you doing, Sarah, in France? I hope the holidays are good and you've got everything that you need there. Beautiful. Kathy is in Green Valley, Arizona with us. Jackie in Charlotte, North Carolina. Shalom. Elise is joining us in West Virginia. Beautiful. Amazing. We have Ruthie with us. To serve or not to serve? Well, we're here to serve. How? Like a child to a parent that is out of love? Or the metaphor of a son to the father? Meaning, our father in heaven? God? Like a son out of love? Devotion? Or child? Same metaphor. Or as a servant? serves a master. So intuitively, we of course think that like a child, I mean, that's love, as opposed to the servant, that might be out of fear. Let's take that apart and understand a little more. Furthermore, what happens if you Think about God and that God is looking at you, only you, because the world was created just for you, to empower you, that you should be the most, the best person that you can, the most godly person that you can. And what happens if you meditate upon that and it doesn't? create a palpable feeling of awe. Oh my gosh. God's looking straight through me. So I've had that experience walking by the Rebbe. The Babacher Rebbe. That when knowing that he sees right through me. And that like creates... But that's because there's a person there who I'm aware, as best as I am aware, of the greatness, the awesomeness of the Rebbe. He's looking, he sees my neshama. When he's looking at that neshama, he's not looking to see, oh, oh, come on, you can be better than that. No, he's looking in order to arouse the depth of the soul that I can serve God better. Where does that come from? How's it, why does Rebbe do that? Because that's what God does to all of us at all times. The problem is that we might, may, might meditate on this and it doesn't arouse a feeling of of awesomeness, of God's presence, of God looking and we're not moved by that contemplation. That God is scrutinizing and sees right through me. To not to not to, to, to shame me, not to judge me, but to empower me. And why might that be that I'm not moved by that contemplation of God? is because our soul comes from a lower level of the ten divine attributes and from a lower world, the world of Asiya. The world of Asiya, the world of action, as opposed to the world of divine emotion, the world of Yitzira. So because we come from a lower grade quality of a soul, that means we're just not refined enough that our meditation, our contemplation, should produce a real 
either feeling or even an intellectual fear of God. Hmm. So what does this leave us with? Says the Alter Rebbe in chapter 41, Nevertheless, if your intent in through that contemplation, through that meditative thought, is to serve, to be a servant of the, to serve the king, to serve God, that is called an avoide gemura, a complete service. Why is it complete? If you don't have a feeling or even an intellectual awe, fear of God. It's because, firstly, fear and service are two separate commandments in the 613 commandments, and one doesn't exclude the other. In other words, the fact that I am intending to serve out of this sense of God's presence, I am aware of it, mindful of it, then that's called serving. And fear is a different mitzvah. Furthermore, says that actually, it's even fear. It's called even fear and awe of God, even though, again, it's not a feeling that you've produced or even an intellectual fear that you experience. And how do you experience it in your mind? Maybe not in your heart. But the fact is that not only do you fulfill the obligation to serve God through that awareness that God is seeing me, looking at me, looking deep within me to empower me. But the fact that we introduce that thought into our minds just by thinking it, right? And our desires to arouse that truth of God seeing me, that is the awe and the slash fear of God. Why? Because in that moment, that I'm thinking this, I'm mindful of this, the fear of heaven is upon me. As the fear of the presence of even a mortal individual that is watching you. What happens when a mortal, simple person, not a king, king watches you, you're, you know, just like the rebel, sees you, you're, imagine just a simple person sees you. What happens as opposed to when you're all alone, well, simple person sees you, you refrain from something that might not be so appropriate in that person's eyes. Right? We act differently when we know someone's looking. That's the fact of life. Intuitively. So what happens if we think about God is looking. In that moment, we act differently. Ah, uh, it's not a palpable feeling. It's okay. My actions are different. That's called the fear of God. We see that even this simple expression of, of, of fear is called the fear of God. Again, fear over here, very important that we always mention this. Not fear of punishment. Not fear of... of um, Oh, I'm bad. I'm terrible. No. The fear meaning of presence. Again, we act differently when someone just walks into the room when we were there all by ourselves in our estimation, right? We act differently. So if your feet are up on the table or you're doing something unseemly, Someone walks into the room, well, you, know, you know, we do, we act differently. And this is brought out in the Talmud, that when Rabbi Yechon ben Zakkai, who was the leader of the Jewish people upon the destruction of the Second Holy Temple in the year 69, the common era, 
when he was on his deathbed, he said to his disciples, may it be God's will that the fear of heaven be upon you like the fear of a human being. The disciples protested. That's all you were expecting from us? Like, aren't we, aren't we better, more than that? Are we so limited to that? So he responded that the proof is indeed true form of fear that we that you know that when a person commits a sin what do they say first they look this way they look that way i hope no one sees me whether you actually say those words or think those words that sentiment is very real so such a fear held rabbi yechanan ben zakai would ensure that they would refrain from doing wrong. That an ordinary human being is watching me. Well, an ordinary human being is watching me. I'm not going to do that which is wrong in front of them. When they're not there, yes. That's a regular normal person now. Some people couldn't give a hoot, right? But a regular, norm, that's an, an, an instinct of every human being, at least. Now, this kind of fear is termed yiratato. It's a lower level of fear. It's a fear that precedes wisdom. There's a higher level of fear, which is like standing before the Rebbe that you're awed out, that you are like feeling the sense of presence, of greatness before you. And you feel humble before that greatness. You sense that. That's a higher level that comes after wisdom, after Torah. So we have two kinds of fear. Lower level that leads to the performance of Torah mitzvahs. In other words, we need this before we even study Torah, as we're doing now. That we that God's present. He's looking at me. Am I re- like? Right? You know, I have you all watching me, so, you know, I, I have that sentiment. But maybe you're in a place where no one's watching you. And right now, you're all over the place, not focused, doing something unseemly that would not be appropriate. I'm not suggesting you are, but perhaps, because no one's there watching you. You're watching me, so I have that awareness. So I'm, you know. But no one's watching you if you're there alone. But what if you thought that God was watching you? What's going to happen? You're going to sit up a little more straight. You're going to kind of focus a little more. That's exactly the point. To think that notion before you study, you're going to study differently. Before you do the mitzvah of giving charity, of praying to God, that you're standing before God and he's seeing you. Or any other mitzvah that you do. That's something that needs to precede the mitzvah. Then there's the higher level that comes after the mitzvah. In other words, that's the idea of the example I give again is going before the Rebbe, that you sense greatness before you and you feel the humility of yourself. Right? This first level isn't that. Now, Without this notion, the lower level of fear that we're talking about, not fear of punishment, fear of presence of God, right? The presence, just like an ordinary person, that we have a sense of fear, right? And fear, you know, the word fear, it's gotten a bad shake. It's not PC. So a lot of you might not be, you know, liking that word. The presence of we act differently that's not coming out of love it's not because the person walked into the room oh because i love you i'm going to act differently no it's their presence that brings oh 
let me act differently. That's called fear. If we don't have this notion, says the Alter Rebbe, our mitzvah cannot soar above. Just as a bird cannot fly with one wing. You need two wings to fly. Fear and love. If you're lacking the fear and you only are motivated to do the mitzvah out of love, God, I love you, I want to study your Torah. God, I love you, I'm giving charity. God, I love you and I'm praying to you. That's wonderful. That's the characteristic of a child to a parent. Serving the parent out of love. But that's one wing. And one wing doesn't make your mitzvah soar on high to the divine to have an eternity to that mitzvah. To be bound to the divine doesn't. Unless, unless you also have the second wing. Or the first wing, whichever one you want to call it. The fear of God, meaning the presence of God in the mitzvah that we're doing. So we need to have ultimately both. And how do we have this? Even by just thinking it. As we mentioned that maybe we're not going to have a real feeling of awe. We're not going to have a real feeling of presence of God. That is But just the fact that we think it and therefore we act differently Right? We just have it in in our thoughts. Likewise, the love of God that we think it. And we, because of that, that creates a desire that we want to connect to him by doing a mitzvah, by occupying ourselves in the study of Torah as we're doing now, or any particular commandment. Then our mitzvah is going to fly on high two wings of the bird that makes the mitzvah connect to the divine. But we need both. The son or the child, the love to the parent or to the father, father our God, our father, and, and together with that, the presence of God. Both things will make our mitzvah that we're doing right now rise above and be connected to the divine attributes, whether in the world of Yitzira, the world of, uh, of Abriya, and to be connected to the divine attributes there that will then be bound up with God himself. It has an eternity to it. And as we've mentioned previously, will also sweeten the severities. So that was a, a note, a parenthetical comment that the author had made previously. Just mentioning it again. And will be then truly experienced that mitzvah, a ray of the light in Gan Eden, the Garden of Eden, and the full force of it in the times of Mashiach. That's as opposed to in the actual act of the mitzvah without kavana, without intent, because we're speaking here about intent, right? The intent of love and awe, but the act itself produces a connection in the moment, not for eternity in the act, but in the moment, they're bound up to the essence of God himself. And that's powerful. That's something to live with on a daily basis. Any questions? Two question marks before you ask a question. So I, if you put it in red, it's even better because then it's just more visible that it's a question.
Davida, it's hard for me at times to have the proper fear since I don't physically see Hashem. They're watching me. It's easy for me to forget sometimes that, that the king is watching. How do I maintain the fear of Hashem at all times? <laughs> Not easy. Just bring it to mind. That's the whole point that we're learning over here in this chapter. This is the beginning. This is the core. This is the root of all service of Hashem is to be mindful that God sees us and looks deep into us to empower us, to give us the, his, the sense of his presence, that therefore we act differently. So it's practice. It's the true faith that we have because it's part of our soul. Right? We're created in the image of God. We, are, we have a peace of God in us. So therefore, that reality is not something outside of us. So it's something that we can conjure up. And the more we engage in it, the more we try this, let's just take a moment and think, as we learned previously, that God animates everything uniquely in this world. And at the same time, He's beyond, transcends everything of this world and animates it from there. And all of that is that he's a creator. He puts aside. That's not important to him. Not that he's not the creator. He is. But that's, he didn't create the world to be a creator. He created the world to have a relationship with us. So he puts that all aside and he's looking collectively as we said, the Jewish people and individually teach in every one of us. And what is he doing? Seeing, looking deeply in our inside. Am I serving God as best as I could? And then we respond as a result of that awareness to serve him, even if it's a small little thing. Right? Even if it's a small little thing, all of a sudden, you know, think of it. When someone walks into the room and you're just doing something that's minimal. Yeah. Yeah. You just, you know, you just change your your behavior. So, yeah, it's a, it's a it's a practice practicing something that we are already that we have in us and we're just honing the skill yeah but it's true it's not the, not um that's the effort that we need to make is to you know to bring it to mind yeah absolutely thank you thank you for that Anybody else? Question, comment, thought? They have what to live with. They had last night TRC. I hope you, you all enjoyed it as I did. <laughs> um, getting over some of my Passover. Cindy, um, this is a fantastic lesson. Oh, thank you. And I can relate it in so many ways. I feel fortunate to have been raised with a Jewish upbringing and to have respect, not wanting to be sh to shame to my parents. Mm. I worry about today's generation without fear of a higher being. Oh, Cindy, well said. Yeah. Yeah, there was a sense that, yeah, that we wanted to bring pride to our parents, right? Not to bring shame. Those come together. And um, that relates to this idea that we're speaking about over here. Now, here we're doing it. You know, for God. But uh, I hear you. I understand that, and um, we—that's uh, why we're teaching this. 
bring another person from the younger generation to join us so that this becomes real for them. Jane, how can one avoid judging him herself? I mean, not being too hard on oneself or failing to follow a mitzvah. And so, yeah, you're right. Human nature is, or at least some people have the nature of being hard on themselves. And that's not coming from a good place. That's coming from brokenness rather than from, you know, uh, wholeness and completion and worthiness. Um, so when we recognize that being hard on ourselves or harsh on ourselves, because what that will happen is bring us to a sadness, bring us down rather than being uplifting. So we have to be careful. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, we need to judge if we do something wrong own it deal with it and move on but don't beat yourself up about it that's not coming from a good place absolutely so yeah that's uh, part of the the work that's part of our work who says it's easy people think that serving god ah you know serving god whoa big deal I mean you just like you know follow what he wants you to do it's all laid out there for you it's so simple for you really now tell me what's simple about this the idea might be simple but living this way it's work and the reason why someone doesn't want to live this way is firstly it's work and secondly in the end I'm doing what God wants, what he needs from me. I'm going to do what I want. I'm going to do what I need. That's how most people look at life. But, of course, that's natural to look at life that way. That is the human condition. What's in it for me? What's best for me? How does this serve me? Rather than how am I serving? Yeah. Well, Yana. Please share with us. also doing the Omer count right now is that we can mitigate our our own um, our own ego and you know I don't know the right word I'm looking for but essentially our ego in order to build that fear and you know as we approach Matan Torah so yeah very good question so we're in the midst of you know between Passover and Shavuos Shavuos is the time that we get the Torah 50 days so for 49 days there's the count seven emotions each emotion coupled with another emotion so you have seven times seven it's 49 that's about a refinement of every specific emotion that we have in us but this is before even that as remember as we started chapter 41 the alternative is said which by the way this is a whole new section that we are now starting from 41 to the end of 50 which will be about our love and awe of god and compassion those are the three emotions that we're going to be dealing with so um this is the beginning this is the root this is the core and the root of everything that we do so before we even refine ourselves we have to relate to to god that he is present the refinement will take place after that we have this basic idea you know dealt with which is 
God is present. He sees what I'm doing. I'm acting differently because of that. So the refinement is based on that principle. Absolutely correct. Thank you. Um, incidentally, we're at day four, not day five, in, in the count. Divida. Hayyim, yaim revi la aimer. Today is the fourth day of the aimer. If you didn't count yet. <laughs> All right, folks. Amazing. Rambam coming up. I'm Rabbi Ronnie Fine coming to you from Chabad Zich and Kadesh in Montreal, Canada. It's a privilege and a pleasure to share with you the Tanya. Have an amazing day. Good Mayate. Celebrations, all good things. We'll continue tomorrow. All the best. <laughs>